Just a quick announcement before we start today's show. If you like live music and you live in the Madison area, on January 26th, 2018, it's a new year, so I wanted to make that clear. That kind of rhymed. My band, Lorenzo's Music, will be playing at The Frequency, along with Boo Bradley and Negative Example. You can check out our music at lorenzosmusic.com. Friday, January 26th, at The Frequency. Hope to see you there. Now on with the show. I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. This season, I'm going to be doing things a little bit differently. Season one, I met random artists in town. But this season, I go to different places around town in Madison. These places are businesses that were started by creatives and help promote other people's art. They're galleries, their shops, their furniture stores, their consignment places, and pop-ups. I wanted to talk to them to find out how they got where they are, how they decided to take their stuff one step further. And I thought maybe that this would be kind of an inspirational thing, not just to me, but to those of you listening. So over the course of this season, each episode will be me asking these 10 different places one question. And maybe it will kind of shed some light on what I myself or you or anyone out there listening who's a creative person could be doing to maybe promote themselves a little bit more, get the work that they make out there. So I'm going to start this week by introducing the different places that we'll be talking to. To get a feel for where we are, I'm going to start out in downtown Madison and work our way around town from there. And the question this week is, what made you decide to start your own business? So let's begin on State Street. My name is Demetrius Morgan, and I'm the executive director of the Yellow Rose Gallery. My name is Micah Henning, and I'm the president of the board of directors for the Yellow Rose Gallery. So located on the 100 block of State Street, and you might miss it if you don't know it's there, the Yellow Rose occupies several floors of this one building. It's like it's like a nice flat with hardwood floors, a place that I'd want to live. It almost seemed like a person did live there and they decided to clear out the furniture. It was actually kind of cool. So Demetrius found me there and he took me to an even larger place a few floors up. This room had even bigger pieces, but it was with conference tables and it was on a carpeted floor. I didn't know that they didn't own the place, but they do take care of it for the actual owner. I wanted to find out how they got involved with it. Well, first, I started off as an artist. Um, I would create websites. I would create posters. I would get the word out a little bit more. And I wanted to be uh, an asset to the uh, galleries. Went from being an artist to becoming now the executive director because of my, uh, I would say, my integrity. My fiance is an artist who shows who works here. So I wanted to help the the agency. The Yellow's Gallery was actually, it was an LLC, it was a for-profit art gallery. Oh, um, And I helped convert it into a non-profit. How did you propose that? It actually wasn't my proposal. The founder wanted wanted it to become non-profit because he knew that he wouldn't be able to be involved as often as he had been. It was very time-consuming work. Given that it was a community-driven art gallery, he thought that the best way to ensure its survival was to make a non-profit. How did you do that? We dissolved the LLC and, uh, you know, filed articles of incorporation for uh, non-stock. Is that really how simple it is? Is it's it's you file go to say that you're a non-profit? Yeah, you you dissolve the, the for-profit and then you create a new non-profit. What's the benefit of a non-profit as opposed to an LLC? I understand he couldn't be involved, but as mm-hmm. a community-driven thing, what's the benefit? Uh, we'll be able to receive donations. People would get tax benefits, and then we don't have to pay taxes on a lot of things. So through donations, is that something that would subsidize keeping the place open rather than counting on selling the art? Yes. While the gallery does, I, I forgot what percentage, they do earn a, a certain portion of art sales. Most of it goes to the artists themselves. What is the difference d- between that and something like crowdfunding? Uh, you get small monies from lots and lots of people. This is similar, except we don't have as many people. Are the sums larger? Uh, no. Okay. We're just we've got a lot less money. And than I don't mean to be them. going into your into your uh, financials here. I'm just I'm curious no, as to we're a nonprofit. Our financials are. That's public. a good point. So, that's yeah. see that's it's hard to it's it's hard for my mind to think that way, which is why I'm asking this. I'm like because mm-hmm. I know a lot of the places around town are nonprofits, mm-hmm. and I'm curious as to the benefit of it, because I don't know what that is. Were you working here when it was a LLC? No. So you had no idea what, basically how the place handled itself before that? No, I, I didn't have any, I didn't have any visibility into that. I just attended the events. So I got to know the owner and then he came to me when he decided that 
we should become nonprofit. I Did you have a background? Or? I do have a background with nonprofits. Okay. I serve on a couple other boards. Can I ask what those are? Stop Heroin Now and the Wisconsin Coalition Against Sexual Assault, WACASA. All of a sudden, I feel like I don't do very many things with my time. <laughs> Madison has a lot of great artists out here. Within the near future, we also want to be educating the uh, community with some classes or something that's artistic to help build the community in an artistic way. How do you reach out to the community? During uh, one of our last events, we had uh, the 9-11 Commemoration Art Benefit. So it only made sense to me to reach out to the fire department and to the Red Cross. And we actually did a blood drive slash 9-11 Commemoration Art Benefit. So in the morning time, as people was donating their blood for that event, we was also promoting our works and promoting the gallery by having artworks and artists paintings from from this gallery to go to their establishment. How about you? What made you decide that this is what you wanted to do? I like to be a part of uh, mission-driven agencies. I like to build things that, you know, help a group of people that truly believe in a cause. Now, the next stop is also on State Street, and it's just one block down from the Yellow Rose Gallery. I'm Laura Komai, and my sister and I co-own the store Anthology. Anthology is across from the Overture Center and the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art. And this cozy place is filled with different items, prints and buttons, just to name a few things. As my wife and I waited for Laura to finish up ringing up customers, uh, we had a look around. And it was then that I actually, here's a weird story, I looked up and... I saw standing in front of me, Greg Proops. Now you may know him as one of the regulars on the show. Whose line is it anyways? The guy with the glasses and the bouffant hair. I just, I just thought it was neat. I looked up and it was like, I said, Hey, Greg Proops. And he just fist bumped me and then walked out. It was really weird. Anyway, when Laura was done, uh, we sat down at a table in the store and it was covered with handmade buttons and pins. And behind Laura, there was like a repurposed farmhouse sink and cabinet. It kind of made the place feel like we were in someone's home. So what made her decide to open her own business? I had basically been 10 years at this local gift store, a lot of luxuries. So I was kind of familiar with the retail setting and had basically worked my way up from sales associate into assistant manager and manager. I like the retail setting. It was really strictly a gift store and that's always what it was. That's what it was supposed to be. I think as a manager that I was kind of like, a little confined by that definition of what that store was supposed to be. And I kind of started to see that the components that I wanted wasn't really something that I could fit into someone else's idea of a store. It was really something that I needed to start from scratch to kind of formulate what Mm -hmm. kind of store we would have. So you felt like you were doing your research by working there. There's a lot of people who would say, if you're going to open your own business, you should have an MBA and you should study how to own a business. But for me, it was really just like on the ground learning from the beginning. You know, first I was a sales associate at a department store and then I moved to a small local business. And so I kind of understood the difference between the corporate world and independent local retail. In doing so, saw pieces that I wanted to create myself. And also the experience is far Mm -hmm. more. I mean, you can teach the concepts, but you can't teach the actual. uh, Yes. Yeah. It yeah. was invaluable. But I really sort of felt that there was this creative component which was missing for myself personally, but also for customers. Mm-hmm. And so the overall mission of Anthology is to facilitate creativity. And so it was kind of this extra piece which I felt that I needed to add in. Now we're going to leave the State Street area and we're going to head towards Williamson Street to a coffee place where the owner sells coffee and he also supports local art and the music scene, and he's also very involved in it. My name is John Heen. I'm one of the owners at Mother Fool's Coffee House on the east side of Madison. I also run a small record label. I freelance as a photographer. I do music, video editing. So if you've ever driven down Willie Street, you've seen this place. The outside has a colorful mural painted on the side of it, and it's always different. So John tells me his first entrepreneurial experience started when he was 15. He created his own Christmas club for family and friends with a membership fee 
and he would deposit the money into CDs at the bank. And then whenever I had $100 total, I would bike to the neighborhood savings and loan and buy a certificate of deposit. And by the beginning of December, I was able to give everyone a very hefty rate of return as well as a really nice profit for myself. And that was my, my first business that made money, I'll say that. Uh, but you were how old? I was 15. It was right at the height of the uh, savings and loan scandal, you know. But at that time, you could buy CDs for six months for $100 at 18% interest. Why did you know that <laughs> at 15? I was interested in math and business. Uh, myself and the other owner, Stephanie Rerick, played in a band together in the early 90s that was booked here at Mother Fools. And that's how I got to know the owner, the old owner. Her name was Jean just through that context uh, of having worked with her, and she must have thought we had our act together, so she offered to sell. And I was in no position financially to do that. I had no credit, I had no savings, uh, but eventually we worked out a deal where she made a no-interest loan to us to be able to do it. So I really feel like it was a gift, more than something I bought. I bought it over the next three years out of the Revenue. Uh, is it a good business decision? Probably not. Um, we were undercapitalized, and that's been difficult for our entire 22 year run. We've never been properly capitalized, you know, so that's a, a trick. And it was losing a lot of money, you know, yeah. so it's not an obvious choice. You gotta be, you don't just go like, all right, go to the store and get us some coffee beans, we'll grind mm -hmm. them up. You, I'm sure you have to pick a wholesaler. We had a number of goals when we started this business. One was to move it towards more of an environmental consciousness. Both Stephanie and me came from Greenpeace, so that's where we first met. So if we're gonna run a business, we wanna do it in the most sustainable way possible. And when your base business is selling a tropical product right. that's shipped halfway around the world, you've got an uphill climb to make it sustainable. I mean, that's just a fact. The previous owner, Gene, was selling coffee from Altera uh, out of Milwaukee. Our goal was to do 100% organic coffee. Uh, Altera had some organics, but it wasn't entirely, and the house blend was not organic here at, at that time. So we were going to look for a more local coffee wholesaler, but Gene convinced us, I'm grateful for this, to just drive over to Milwaukee, meet with the owners of this company, see what they can do for us. They were awesome. We had a wonderful afternoon and found that they really shared our values. They were very concerned about organic and supporting the farmers. Uh, so we worked with them to change the house blend to a completely organic coffee. So that was one of the first things we did. And then we have been with them ever since. They changed their name to Collectivo. So Mother Fools was one of their first out of Milwaukee customers. And we've been with them now our whole run, 22 years. You know, they've helped us a lot during our first expansion, which was in 1997, which built this room we're sitting in, our credit was not well established. We did not have the ability to go to a bank and get a loan for it, but Altera actually extended us terms, which is a form of giving a loan to a business. So one of your suppliers helped? Normally, their terms are 30 days, meaning uh, any product that they deliver, they expect payment for within 30 days. They let us extend our terms to one year. You know, which is basically a $20,000 loan. So that was really kind of them. And then they let us you know, gradually come back into terms within about three years. Man, you weren't kidding that going down there was actually a good idea. Well, they were great, you know, and it makes sense from their business perspective. Why not mm -hmm. give a loan to a small cafe in Madison that's gonna keep selling your product? Just kind of shows like, well, that's a don't judge book by its cover sort of situation, yes. you know? Yes, I've learned that lesson over and over. Yeah. You know, it's really easy to come into any situation with assumptions. And huh. It's usually not healthy. Now a couple more blocks down on Willie Street, right across from the co-op, is a unique industrial modern furniture shop. I'm Kyle Stoldorf and I'm owner-operator of Pieces Unimagined and the interior statement on Willie Street. Now this place is filled with large tables, cabinets, lights, and things like that. Most seem to be mixtures of wood and metal and each one is completely different, which is how Kyle meant it to be. So we sat at one of these large tables in one of the now two connected stores and he told me what he did before opening the store and what led up to deciding to open this place. I ran an antique shop that was the world's largest selection of antique advertising in the world. <laughs> antique and, advertising, like yes. actual metal plates and all that kind of yep. stuff? Oh, signage, wow. um, anything you'd find in a general store, a pharmacy, what a blacksmith would have. So anything that the general public was not really meant to have. 
would be my specialty. And so we did that for years, and then I decided to give back and I started a church and did that for a decade, and then I wow. retired from that, and now I'm doing what I, what I want to do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How long ago did you retire from the church? Four years ago. And what made you decide this was the type of place you wanted to open? What well, because that? this is the stuff that I have always loved, but nobody else did for years. So in the antique business, this kind of stuff wasn't really popular. It was relegated to the bargain basement, the industrial modern feel. Well, it was about 10 years ago that Industrial Modern started to hit the Midwest, and it was fantastic. And I'm like, can you believe that people actually finally appreciate what this is? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I want to be part of that. I want to be someone who offers it. I want to be somebody who helps people figure out how they can get it into their houses. And part of that that factors in is that I've had matchy-matchy house before. I've had the, the mahogany office and I've had mission oak throughout the whole house. And even far back, we had Victorian. I hate that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> now, in context though, if it's usable and if it's beautiful and it works with your lifestyle, then you should have that. But you can go ahead and mix deco, you can mix Victorian, you can have industrial modern, and you can put mm -hmm. it all together. And if you love it, that's awesome. And so that's one of the ways that we're helping people see in picture how they can actually do that. And then in particular, things that aren't so big box so that your neighbor doesn't have it. And that's where the art comes in. So now you start taking industrial metal legs from 1870, throw a slab of wood from 1890 on it, and now you've got this table that nobody else has, and it lasts absolutely forever, mm -hmm. unless you purposely destroy the darn thing. <laughs> and then the artist gets this stuff on display. They are sturdy. I will, yeah. I will admit that. One of our uh, claim to fame on our furniture, with almost no exception, you can dance on all of our furniture, whether it's designed <laughs> for that or not. <laughs> so if you ever make a commercial, we already know what the pinch is going to be. Know. Yes. Okay. One more place on Willie Street just down the corner from Pieces Unimagined is a place that started as one shop also and ended up expanding into the space next to it too. My name is Tammy Schreider and I'm the owner of Hatch Art House and also Hazel General Store. The Hatch Art House is right by the Crystal Corner on Willie Street, has a huge selection of creative pieces with their own local artist touch. And the Hazel General Store is for items that people who make those types of things might need for themselves. So what made her decide to open her own business? So Hatch Art House is seven years old in December and Hazel General Store is two and a half years old. Really? And then last year in October, so exactly a year ago, we tore the wall down to make it easier for our customers of both shops to walk between the shops. So it was separated? Oh, always, yeah. I just got the okay from my landlord to tear the wall down and that's how it happened. Okay. You're doing so well with one that you just expanded into the space next to you? It opened up. So the, the store not next to us shrunk, basically. It was just kind of brainstorming with some friends, like, what do I want to be next door to me? Who, who would be a great neighbor? You know, all those questions. And from having Hatch Art House for so long, I've, I know what a lot of the neighborhood and neighborhood customers are looking for. And so I just went from that, and that's where the modern day general store came from. It focuses on what our neighborhood needs. Somebody was asking me for a great backpack when they were over at Hatch. They're like, where can I buy something that's well made and I don't have to travel to the mall or I don't even want to go downtown. I want to stay here in my neighborhood. So that's where the, the concept of Hazel came from. It just became a time, you know, I, I hit 40 and I was like, I need to do something else and I need to do something that's very fulfilling for me mm -hmm. and that I will feel passionate about but I really needed to work with other artists. I felt like that was my passion, or I, I mean, I still feel that way, but that's what drove me to basically just leave everything and take what I, the money that I saved and move back to Wisconsin. It was really just a, it came from a need of having art galleries that were really casual and made people feel comfortable going into them and, and weren't just for the, the upper class, so to speak. I remember going into art galleries when I was younger and just 
feeling like I didn't belong and that the people working there made me feel that way as well. Mm -hmm. That all grew into my yearning basically to open up my own art gallery someday that was casual and, you know, something for everybody. Price points for everyone. I love upcycling and reusing things. Just a, a need to try to keep things out of the landfill as much as possible. Now we're going to move out to the Atwood location over by Revolution Bikes and the Ohio Tavern. My name is Mia Broderson and I'm the owner of the Stone Fence. We sat down on a couple of chairs right at the front section of the store by the picture window and people continued to look around as we set up. Let's find out why she decided to start her own business. And before we get started, I had to bring up this strange connection that Mia and I both have had over the years. We've randomly known each other for some reason over the years. Yeah. Because yeah. you knew people I knew. We've just both been in Madison our whole lives. Yes. That's how this town works. Yes, it is. I kept driving past this vacancy. Uh, it used to be absolutely art on the way to work. That's what this place was. Yeah, for nine years, this is absolutely art. So it was kind of easy to slide in. The neighborhood was already used to being able to pop in and buy things here. So I kept driving past and thinking, oh, that would be really close to home. That would be a great spot. And so it just kind of happened that way. My lease was up and this one was vacant. The original owner of Stone Fence, did you say she retired or? She retired, yeah. When okay. she retired, I purchased it. And I would tried other things. I would left and worked in an accounting firm and I tried substitute really? teaching and I just liked retail. Okay. Every day is different. You know, you're not stuck in an office, so I just enjoyed it. I, yeah, I don't know how I would describe it, but it was not what it is today. No, not at all. We had, uh, in the 90s, we, you know, we were on the collectible bandwagon and went through. A collectible, that's day. what I was looking yeah. for. We had a lot more kitchen, housewares. It was, it was just a different, it was a different ball game completely. What made you decide to go the direction that you did go with this place? I used to do art, I don't anymore, but I was an art major in college. This is kind of me, where the other one wasn't. Okay. The other one was, I can run this the way it is, but it wasn't really me. This is more me. Where did you go to school for art? Uh, UW-Madison, fine art, mostly oil paintings and sculpture. Did you decide to do this because you knew artists? Because I don't think right away you started bringing in localized art. In here right away we did. I had tried to a little bit at Hilldale, okay. and it just didn't fly there. At all. Well, yeah, th <laughs> they stuck you in front of the grocery store, too, so that probably had something to do with it. Yeah, yeah, our foot traffic pretty much died there. Now we're going to take a left off of Atwood and go towards Milwaukee Street. Tucked away in one of the side streets over there, there's a warehouse that is the location for a new creative facility for local artists. I'm Sarah Arts. I'm the founder and owner of 11000, which is a Madison, Wisconsin-based creative studio. When you pull up, the outside is very large and nondescript to look at it. The walls are covered with white metal siding, and it looks like a place where trucks probably might load and unload things. When you're walking in, you realize that they're super high ceilings, and uh, I mean, it just looks like an industrial place. And it's filled with artist equipment and printing stations and work tables for you to do stuff on. It's just all packed with equipment. And just like the Yellow Rose, 11000 is a membership-based location, but it's not a nonprofit organization. I actually specifically chose not to be a nonprofit because okay. I feel like if I'm supposed to be helping makers and creatives build sustainable businesses, then I should be able to do the same thing. Yeah, so membership organization means that people can pay a membership fee and belong. Whether or not they need space to create doesn't matter as much. It's more so that they want to be part of a professional network. And the reason I ask is because yeah. one of the galleries I talked to just turned to a nonprofit. Yes. One of the things they do is they do membership programs so yes. to help sustain the nonprofit. So yes. that's why I thought yeah. I'd check. Uh, membership models for nonprofits are very typical thing. For us to even be in the arts and be a for-profit or an LLC is different in the game of art scene in general. And for the membership, that's for people to come by, not for you still rent spaces here as well. People join because they want to be a part of this network that helps them grow stronger businesses and helps them connect to peers for collaborations and support. And some people also need space, so they might rent studio space from us or get involved with a lot of the events that we do. I was an art major in college and I decided that 
I needed to find something where I could get a real job because I didn't know what I would do with an art degree. The art degree was very focused on painting and drawing and, and typical things, which never really spoke to me as much. And so when I graduated, I got a job in marketing, which was a different type of creativity, but it never really felt like the right type of creativity for me. And so about eight years into my career, I started doing upholstery on the side. And so when I did upholstery, I felt this is this really cool hands-on type of creativity where I could furnish my house that I had just bought and I could like build furniture and like all these possibilities felt open to me. And so then I wanted to find more of that community. I'm like, okay, so now where are all my people? Like, where can I go to like do upholstery with people? Where can I find cool handmade fabric? Where are these other types of artists that I see in Brooklyn and Nashville and Grand Rapids and different places? And I saw that there were a lot of really cool people doing things in the city, but a lot of them didn't feel connected to a creative community. I'd always known that I wanted to start a business, but I didn't know what, and it kind of all came together at the same time, and I said, I think something could happen here, and it's happening in other places, and so I'm going to quit my career and try to build this community that I want to be a part of. Now we're going to leave here and go to the Far East side. Now, I've lived in Madison my whole life, and a lot of people like to think that where we just were, Willie Street and Atwood Avenue, is the east side. And I always have to tell them, it's not. There's still quite a few more miles left to go from there. And how do I know? Because that's the east side I grew up with. And in that area is my old high school. And past that, at the very end of Monona Drive, is the next place I visited right by the Beltline. It's owned by two people who we realized I went to high school with them. I'm Leah Robertson and I paint most of the furniture and do the displays of Booth 121. And I'm Rebecca Aid, and I do all the stuff she doesn't like to do. (laughs) I didn't know that there were so many people like Sarah from 11000 and Kyle from Pieces Unimagined who, so that there was so many furniture places like this. And it seems that it's also what began this process for Leah at Booth 121. It started out with just needing furniture for my first house and not having necessarily the money or being able to find the style that I wanted. I'd have one of my grandmother's old tables and a bunch of leftover paint and, hey, I'll paint this and make it fit for what I wanted. And so I did it as a hobby for probably now over 20 years. I saw that painted furniture was getting popular and that's what prompted me. I did my first show and saw, okay, I I think I have something Mm -hmm. here. Because I tend to go a little on the wild side with my pieces. But people were responding to it and I thought, oh, okay. Let's make this happen. So you just picked it up one day, just decided you wanted to do it. And selling it through Facebook. I had a booth at the Antique Mall, hence the name. I was in booth 121 and I got a glorified storage unit had my furniture hoard there and would have open houses every once in a while and would also do craft shows the crafty fair was the big one that i would do that just got to be too much and too hard on my body and Uh hauling stuff around when you were doing it on facebook how were you actually selling it was it just i would have things at the antique mall and again i would promote the shows and then i would also do commission pieces so people would bring me their piece of furniture and i paint that for them you didn't have a card or anything like that on there or use facebook payments no did craft shows and then would have these open houses every once in a while at my storage unit and sell out of there. Rebecca approached me, you know, she was bartending a lot and looking to do something else. And she's got a business background, went to school for it. And I said, well, let's open up a a retail store. I knew a lot of people from doing the craft show circuit. We brought them in on consignment and that's where it started. Mm -hmm. Quit my job at Dean Medical Center, worked there full time for 16, 17 years. Really? Yeah. I couldn't sit behind the computer one more day. (laughs) Yeah, I worked in reporting, so it was all analytics and numbers, and it's just not me. So from Monona Drive, you can get on the Beltline. And on the Beltline, head all the way west, to the very west of Madison, out by Airport Road. And you'll find the next place that I went to. Anastasia Corpitz, and I am the owner of Confectionique. Now, when I say airport road, it isn't just a name. There's literally a personal airport out there. I walked into the building, and I was greeted by a sign on the door welcoming me. And when I walked into the shop, I was also greeted by a very friendly bonjour. My French accent is horrible, so that sounded weird. Now, much like Leah at Booth 121, Anastasia started out with a booth at craft shows. And she did this in her spare time alongside her day job. How did it become the type of place you wanted? I was traveling to Paris before I opened Confectionique. Okay. But I was doing small craft shows 
And the things that I always gravitated toward were making things that, to me, felt like something I would find in a boutique in Paris. Just the colors and just, I don't know, just thoroughly being inspired by by Paris in general. The things I was making in general related a lot to French goods in some way or another. And so that just kind of followed along. It's always been the things that I've enjoyed making. Okay. And now it's just like a bigger version of my little booth that I once had years ago. <laughs> what really was it has... like when you first started? Like, how did it start out? Well, it, when it first started, I just didn't have the best of displays. And when I started a long time ago, I actually had a business partner for about two years. And then she and I worked on it together, and it was just kind of very bare bones. And then mm -hmm. she went off and started her own business. And then I've continued this on ever since. And it's grown in that I've sort of learned a lot from the customers about what they like. I know you've said that you go to Paris mm -hmm. and view what's going on there and mm -hmm. then bring it back. Mm -hmm. You actually do that. I do. My husband and I go to Paris twice a year, typically. Mm. From the moment I saw Paris years and years ago, I fell in love with it. And everybody has their I fell in love with it place. You know, some people it's Door County, some people it's up north, some people it's in Mexico, but my place that I love right away was Paris. So from the beginning, I have shipped things home. I am a recently retired social worker, actually. I worked at UW Hospital uh, with dialysis patients for over 20 years, and this was always an outlet for me after working in that setting. It's kind of my self-care. Working with people who are living with chronic illness helps you have a better perspective on your own life. And I learned things about don't wait to do some of the things you really want to do. Don't uh, put off some till tomorrow what you can do today. You know, all of those things that seem kind of trite, but really are very true. So were you doing this and, and mm -hmm, that? Okay. Mm -hmm. And when, when did you start? When did I start this shop? Yeah. Oh, I think it's been about eight years now that I've done this shop. My goal was always, oh, I, I was going to finish up at the, as a dialysis social worker, and then I would have much more time to devote to this. It would be go to work, come here at night, work, you know, set up, go home, go to work. It was tough, but I've loved it so much that it's, it's been worth it. It's named Confectionique. I made up that name. I looked at a bunch of different names online, and I was getting so frustrated. And then my husband finally said, you know, you just simply have to make up a name. I think that's just the only way it's going to work. And so I thought about Eek, Eek, I-Q-U-E, like Confectionique. And so I thought, you know, that's boutique and whatnot. Is That's a phrase or the end of a word you often see in Paris. So I thought that would be the perfect something to pair with Eek. Okay. And then confection, I decided upon because I really wanted to be sweet, but in a whole different way. <laughs> <laughs> not with pastries and such. Not with pastries, <laughs> not with calories, but with just sweetness in a whole different way. Now from the furthest west side of Madison, I'm going to head back downtown and on my way, right off of John Nolan Drive, I make a stop at one more place. Tammy Reschke, uh, the name of my business is The Bohemian Bobble and I make jewelry. The Bohemian Bobble isn't a shop or a store. It's Tammy's home. It's funny, she had a dog running around who at first was very friendly. But as we started recording, and it started barking, so we had to put it upstairs. It was still a nice dog. Now the interesting thing about Tammy is, is she didn't even start out thinking about making jewelry or selling it. So what made her decide to start her own business? I started way back when I was in my early 20s. A friend taught me how to make jewelry one holiday when I didn't have a bunch of money for gifts. So she had been making jewelry for a long time. So she showed me how to make some earrings and I loved it. And so I kind of ran with it and it just grew from there. Like it started by gifting things to family and friends mm -hmm. and then people actually wanting to buy the things from me and this whole time I still had a day job so I did the jewelry on the side and I did that for years and years and then finally one year I went uh, I'm leaving the day job and I'm going full out so you were making enough to do that or if you yeah. just decided at my day job at the time there was some stuff going on where they were laying off a lot of people uh -huh. and so I got offered a voluntary layoff and it was like, it was the moment mm -hmm. where I saw the fork in the road. I thought there's never going to be another time for me to get 
have such a great opportunity because I got a little severance package and I had health and dental coverage for like six months. It felt like a gift to me Hmm. and like I'd be silly to turn my back on it. I've had zero regrets looking back. But I would say when I started, I started with not the greatest supplies, base metals and cheaper beads. Some might even have been plastic. As the years went on and, and people got more interested in my things, then I started upgrading to better materials. Did you know that you didn't have better materials or was it just, I'm working with this, this is how I'm making it? You didn't know any better. I probably didn't know any better. And honestly, even if I had, though, I didn't have the cash flow coming in at the time to be able to... The I don't want to say crappy beads, but the you know the you're not going to offend the bead conglomerates. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big jump to go from that to using semi-precious stones and precious metals and things like that. Most people who start as making jewelry with beads, they probably start exactly the way that I did. Who taught you how to do it? Well, my friend who taught me how to make the earrings or whatever. And then I just kind of, I was self-taught mostly. I've taken a couple classes here and there over yeah. the years, but we're talking like a span of 25 years. So most of what I do is self-taught. Is that person your direct competition today? <laughs> oh no, she's not. She's still, I still can totally consider her my mentor. I think I blow her mind now. Okay. She's like, oh my God, I can't believe what you've done with this. And I was oh. like, and it's all because of you. So she gets lots of free stuff. <laughs> no, I would hope so. <laughs> yeah. You started with earrings. Yeah. And then you So kind now of I do off. I do all sorts of types of jewelry, all different designs of from bracelets to necklaces to cuffs to rings. I'm not a metalsmith, so I don't work with heat. I do do riveting and cold connection stuff, but no heat. I'm, ca- I'm kind of scared of heat. I like not why. even soldering no, or anything? No, really? I don't solder anything. So mm-hmm. what do you do? I wire wrap. and You do I, it all by hand? Yep, I do it all by hand, oh, which okay. is why I have like a whole bunch of braces I have to wear because it's really taken a toll on my oh, thumbs yeah. over the years. Yeah, I'm looking around right now and I don't even see any like vice grip sort of things to hold They're it. So you little, just... Yep, it's little handheld tools. You, okay, yeah, you do it all by yeah. hand. You all by hand. And then I hammer things and I emboss things and I etch things and I hand paint things and okay. sand things. My stuff has really evolved over the, the years that I've been doing it. What about the lettering? I know that you put a lot yeah, of lettering on stuff. Yeah, the hand stamping. That's d- probably just a couple years old. Okay. And I really, like when I first started, it was frustrating because mm-hmm. I wasn't any good at it. And nobody really likes to do things they're not good at. Now I'm awesome at it. And I'm like, yeah. ding, 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 ding. <laughs> just moving right along. So that's our cast of shops, galleries, coffee houses, just local stores, local art supporters that we'll be talking to this season. Each week, I'm going to be asking a different question, trying to delve deeper into what they do, how they do it, and what you can learn from it, just like they did, by example. I want to thank everyone for talking with me, and I want to thank you all for listening. If you're just hearing this for the first time, you can subscribe to the show at AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe. The music is provided by my side project, Romcom, and you can listen to more at AmericanBandito.com slash music. And while you're at the website, you can read my daily comic journal called Then This Happened. I don't blog, but I draw little sketches about what I do every day. Thanks again for listening. I'll be back next week with more. So long. Mm-hmm.